the whole idea behind what we're doing now is to try and bring the two together. That the cutter, the textbook, the research that has taken place over hundreds of years or the last hundred years can be drawn upon and can become combat. Onigashimasu. Welcome back to the Gojuri Karate Center. Today we're going to do randori. We're going to try to keep it very basic. We might do a little recap of what we've done in the last couple of uh, videos. I think we've done two videos on randori skills. We're in the process of developing the idea that we're utilizing for our randori. Um, our point of departure is a randori is educational. Um, it is an experience to learn how to do combative work. Two, it is a development and it is an extrapolation from our kata and it is showcasing the bunkai of goju karate in combat. Three, we're working towards a softer, more gentle, um, less damaging format of randori so that we can do more of it and we can develop our skills. To help people understand that it doesn't always have to be this massive physical interaction that favors a bigger, stronger opponent, but rather that it is a development of your karate skills and a development of your mindset is very, very important to us. Today we're going to run through randori. It may be different from what you do. Please do what your sensei says wherever, wherever you come from. And if this triggers a couple of ideas for you, that's great. Hey, onigashimasu. Right, our first idea that we're working off of is punching, hooking, hammer fist. And we're going to do three and change over to three. So if Brian is stepping and punching to my face, I am moving to the outside, trying to get to the elbow, shoulder, ideally close enough to look into his ear. And we're going to use a kake uke or a hike uke, however you choose to name it. So let's go with that right hand first. One, then he chooses from the other two techniques. I move again, go two, control that arm, keeping it down, and three. All right, so this is a basic exercise and was towards a high point of where we were going. Then I start, so one, two, you don't necessarily have to use the same or a different hand. You could use the same hand over and over. Brian is going. One, two, three. He did two hammer fists in a row. All right. One, two, three. And we can continue with this. So, hey, thanks, Brian. We're going to try and keep it as simple as possible, keeping it slow and continuously moving. Instead of doing a high block, we're now going to be doing something low block or even pulling. So if Brian's kicking one, moving to the side, he can now kick again two and three. Okay, using a straight kick, we're blocking down. We can also do the exact same thing by mixing it up with other kicks. So front kick, round ass kick, side kick. All right, knee kick's a little bit harder, but you can still work around it. And that just means getting to the source a little bit sooner or making a little bit of space to play on where you're at in space against your opponent. It's pointless me doing knee kick here. It doesn't affect him. Okay, so if I'm doing front kick, round ass kick, maybe back kick, and we can move to the same position. So if the kick has straight direction, you deal with it the exact same way. The only problem is when a kick is curving. All right, and in those cases, most of the time, what we want to do is block and parry. We don't spend a lot of time doing the very high kicks, but you'd use the exact same ideas as blocking or blocking from a high attack to deal with from a punch with a high kick, like a round ass kick, etc. All right, we tend to favor kicking low, and we tend to favor movement over and above blocking. So if you're out the way, it's a little bit better. We're going to do a third drill, and this drill is about keeping posture and guard up, but maneuvering feet. And again, it's that ability to shift and redirect oneself. I'm just going to do it. Hopefully, I'm, I'm in shot still. But pulling the foot back and shifting and maybe changing the direction is very important. 
if we're getting out the way and we're maneuvering ourselves in a good way, we're not sustaining continuous blows against our body that are ultimately going to leave us incapable of doing any combat. Let's go, Brian. So we're in this position here, and if I'm doing, for instance, sweep, all you're going to do is move back and redirect yourself, and if you can, try go to the outside. So sweep, and he's going to go to the outside. Roundhouse kicks to the... And even... All right. Problem there, we're going to just come back and shot a little bit, Brian. If I do this and he goes back, but he leaves his face where it was, move. this is obviously a, a, a problem. So when you move, you want to keep your head above your hip at all times. There shouldn't be a lag, so try to keep your head above your hip. There we go. And if I was you, I would try to break the line. So instead of going directly back, maybe a little bit to the corner and repositioning. So something like this. So we have three different tiers. We've got a hand tier, we've got a kicking tier, and we've got a low kicking tier or sweeping tier. So here we go. Brian has to maneuver, block, and reposition as much as he can. So there was my hand. There was my kick. There's my, my sweep or low kick. Now Brian attacks from that position because he's now moved. I've put myself in a vulnerable position. He attacks one. There's my first block, two, three. If the kick seems like it's going to get a little bit higher, obviously put a hand in. Having the extra insurance is useful. So we do it again. I'm going to attack first, and I also don't have to... I can set the parameter of I attack in order. Hand, kick, low kick. But ultimately, you want to randomize it because in randomizing it, this person has to then develop their 20-20 vision, their fighting per peripheral vision, which enhances their ability to deal with attacks. So here we go, Brian, in a random order. Here we go. Brian's attacking. Okay. So... Sometimes I, no reason to move. Sometimes just lift and reposition the feet. I'm going to move on to other drills which are more tactile drills that will help develop your ability to have comfort and confidence in your blocking. Okay? We may have done this in video two. So if Brian is punching to my chest, one, not to the center, let's go to the floating ribs, punching. Keep going at a constant speed. So we encourage our students to have this metronome effect. So he's punching, and my first activity usually is to tell people, try and see what's happening, and then we're going to be working with the hands. So I think I have definitely done this. Keep going, Brian, keep going. Nobody said stop. Okay, and then I'm going to go and move a hand inside. What's very important and it's really difficult to get your head around is the idea that people tend to do this. Okay, so this is the very, very rhythmical and building your comfort and confidence. I'm comfortable. I'm no longer being stressed or freaked out by the fact that punches are flying towards my body. I can do the same thing with kicks. I can do the same thing with punches to the face. All right? As long as my opponent has got control, it's a good thing. What we then can build on is the idea of variable height. So if Brian is punching, he's got a jaw down punch. He can have a chew down punch, get down punch. So this is classical three-level training. And most people practice high, middle, low, high, middle, low. So keep going. One, two, three. One, two, three. Right? And again, it's about building comfort. And in this case, I'm trying to build an ability to see what's going on. You may have to slow this exercise down as you start the activity so that you can become comfortable with different blocking techniques. Remember, we can use basic hand techniques that are the same all the time. So, are you going, Brian? Let's go.
moments later. More moments later. Okay, so if we stop there for a second. Most of the time, I was working on this. Now, the critical part of doing sandangi, and if you go back and you have a look at our video on uh, sanbon kumite, sanbon zuki kumite, sandangi, is to build confidence in the individual techniques. The next thing, it is far more wise and prudent to use two hands. The next tip I would have is as much as possible you would like to govern the center line in combat. All right, not my ideas, not my teaching method, but something I learned from uh, the Karate Do International Renme is controlling the center line is critical. So as much as you can, then a small movement. And I, I tend to favor open hand blocking rather than closed hand blocking. Um, small movements can have a very large effect. The next thing is, if I look at where I place my hands, stay there, Brian, for a second. If I'm standing like this and my hand is here, this hand can be behind it. Should I miss with this block, this hand can come up and cover. The reality is that because the punches are cyclical and there's no pause and static end point, it's not like I have time to catch up and make sure that I finish here, but Touch, go, and move. And the final thing is, don't be afraid, if need be, to move your head and your torso. Extend the punch so that it's going to this. This might be a gargantuan flop. All right? So if Brian is punching here, and I am moving my body. Don't punch Q. All the way through. No, just punch straight, controlled. Remember, we don't want to break the microphone. So, we just want to try and twist the body so that we are developing the body movement. I haven't moved my feet, okay? But I'm making sure that as he's punching, I'm using my body. So if I square up and he punches, that I can twist. I square up and I allow him to punch. This way I'm trying to encourage my body and trying to teach my body how to have body movement. We have a very similar drill. Let's come this way a little bit, Brian. Put your hand by my face. We have a similar drill that we used to use for tournament fighting where the person would put their glove or their fist in your face and your job would be to try and slip around that arm. And the reason for this was the idea of, of blocking, should I be hypothetically doing tournament, is that it's not all this hand and but my hand plus my head plus my foot breaking the line to allow me to execute a technique. We're still going to try and use this because it's good combative common sense. My great grandfather kind of used to, something that's filtered down through our family, always used to say common sense is not so common. So we have to train it and we have to work on it. That's the only way we get a little bit better. And along the way, you're going to make mistakes. We're human. And those mistakes, if the environment is a soft, not going to be as costly as if it is physically hard and somebody's hitting you and breaking your teeth or breaking your nose and leaving you with a blue eye and you're having to explain at work on the next day. So um, we did blocking and some extra ideas that you can take off as a short tangent, um, body movement, head movement. Okay, so Brian, we're doing the randomized face, chest, stomach in any particular order, go. So, Brian is starting in any order that he wants now. And now, I have to start reading. And my goal, uh, not my goal, my, uh, my advice would be, as much as possible, look at the source, okay? So we, we're working on the random heights, and we're gonna change it as we go along. So, observation first. Sometimes people make patterns, by the way. And then, two hands and off you go. Day two. Ah! <laughs> Day three. No! 
on got through. Uh, keep going. Why are you stopping? Why are you stopping? I thought you were going to talk to the camera since ah, I Ah, let's go. I'll tell you when to stop, Brian. Don't worry. When I look like a truly idiot. Day four. All right, let's stop there, Brian. Hey, you must. Out the frame. So some of the most important things that you can take from this is, A, you make mistakes. First and foremostly, you're going to get hit. Question is, do you step back and go, that's the end, or do you carry on? Try to learn from the mistakes. Uh, in my case, I sometimes start to try and predict where he's going. Sometimes I make the movements too big, or I push too far. And by pushing too far, I create an opening that allows him to slip the next punch through without too much resistance because I've overcommitted. Blocking is like scoring a goal in football. All right? A miss is a miss. All right? If the ball doesn't go across the line in football, it's not a goal. The ball goes over the line one centimeter, it's a goal. Ball goes all the way into the back of the net, it's a goal. The same thing with what we're doing now. If I can force him to just miss, it's either short, it's not crossing the line. I'm defending the idea that anything that gets to a target, doesn't matter if it is just there for a split second or it's there for a prolonged number of blows, um, is success for him. So I need to make him miss in whatever way. If that includes moving my body, moving my hands to intercept, having the blow getting partially absorbed by my hand and the twisting of my body. Right, so we've covered all of these things and we've built a whole bunch of exercises over time to improve our coordination, to improve our comfort levels, to improve our ability to work with more and more randomized blows being rained down on you. Now what we want to do is we need to start putting in the best defense. Again, uh, something I learned from my father. My father's a prolific football player in his day, and my grandfather was as well. Uh, for the Americans, I mean soccer, English football, a round ball, not the spiral throwing one. And um, the best defense is attack, is to be on the offensive. The moment you start hitting back, you force your opponent to stop attacking and start defending. We're going to work on one change, one change, one change. Brian will do one attack, I will block and counter. My counter will be the attack for Brian to block and counter. And effectively, it will be, just be a, like a, a, an ebb and a flow, one for one for one. And this is the next step in building good randori because no longer are you allowing the person to hit you at any random point, but you're actually starting to try and encourage the person to attack you and that you're constantly moving, blocking, and moving around. So let's go, Brian. So for this now, I would no longer suggest standing in a neutral stance. So if you both want to take some kind of guard or some kind of position, um, in terms of where we start with, for most beginners, I would suggest arm up with a bit of a V, other hand up with a bit of a V, and one in front of the other. When I used to teach sport karate, we used to talk about V and L, because there's a lot of blocking with this hand and retaliation with this hand. The moment you drop this hand, you're constantly going to think of it that way. I want both hands up and the most important thing is to try not to repeat the same technique over and over and over. It's a comfort thing for most people, but you do have to challenge yourself to variety of techniques, variety of trajectories, and variety of targets. Hey, let's go, Brian. Very slow. Here we go. Let's stop there. Just a small snippet. 
But this is how randori ought to be worked on at a very, very low level. Try and avoid having too much ego and continuously trying to get a variety of techniques. You should have seen palm strikes and that. Yes, as a criticism, as a critique of what we just did, the sheer number of straight punches, um, whether they were face height or to the body, was too high. However, ideas such as front kick, elbow, palm strike, hook, back kick, all these techniques were slowly starting to come in. The more you can get away from the straight punches, because that's the easy option for us most of the time, the more we're going to be building our randori. So we're going to be working with the idea now that the person is going to have to block, they're going to have to move, and this is very similar to a series of drills to improve blocking, comfort, but also the ability to feel and sustain some element of shock. So you could use big gloves, and the person can be hitting with big gloves. You, I'm going to use uh, little hand paddles, which will allow me to hit, and we're going to work from there. Hi, hey, Brian, come, let's go, please. And it's going to make a lot of noise, so bear with us. Um, hopefully, Zoe will put some music over this, and uh, you might not hear the slapping and the crack of the <laughs> paddles too loud. Hey, she must. Okay, stop moving your feet. Mind the light behind you. Come a little bit this way. Moving around, moving around, moving around. Moving around, moving around. Come so you're in shot a bit. There we go. Stop dominating on one side. Changing your feet. There we go, good. Breathe, you must breathe, you must breathe. Better. Hey. Last night, a lot of my adults had smiles from ear to ear because they were able to hit one another. And everybody likes the hitting part. Everybody hates being on the receiving end. However, it does build a certain amount of confidence in dealing with what's happening. I'm gonna go back to very basic. So last night, in my actual class, we worked around the idea, brand new students wanting a little bit of a pragmatic, practical outcome for what they're doing. Sometimes students don't understand that face block is a very complicated technique and they need something short that they can take with them when they leave the dojo. And they can get this after one or two classes, and it keeps them enthralled. So I'm going to show you a drill that we did last night. Hopefully we'll be able to do it. And what we're going to do is, I'm going to use the hand pedal. I'm going to put it on my shoulder. Okay, and this is to develop that simultaneous block and strike idea, which you would then eventually, this is the hard training that coupled with the soft randori, eventually if you're applying it in reality, could mean an effective blow. And all I'm gonna do, swing down, and Brian is gonna push, and in this case, he can either do a punch, because he's a karate person who's done karate for a while, or an open hand strike. I prefer open hand strikes from a self-defense pragmatic point of view, you have more options. Punch, if you're a more seasoned karate person, you've got strong hands and strong wrists. Hi Brian, come let's go. Brian is gonna take his guard, he now knows he's gonna hit with this hand to here, and I'm going to be testing him here. So as I do this, he wants to get this. Now, there's no point in just leaving this hand here and I'm hitting his arm. The critical part of this is that I actually need to be aiming for his head, forcing him to block and to cover his head. He can block outward or he can block by sliding the hand back and having that arm up to protect his head. 
Okay, so here we go, Brian, are you ready? Oh! <laughs> You're really clocking it. <laughs> okay, it's that simple. You can do it over and over, and what we would do is we would do, let's say, 20 right and then 20 left, just building on this. The overall picture for today Rundori lesson number three. Number one, we work towards a soft, continuous learning experience trying to build our, our ideas. Number two, we have to at some point accept that we're going to get hit and we have to work on the blocking extensively. The best defense, three, is retaliation. The moment you start hitting back, we're starting to force the person onto the other leg. We're literally forcing them to change their position and absorb rather than just continuously swinging and hitting. To bring in the brutality and the physicality, bring in implements, focus pads, lollipops, or what we call it. Brian, will you get me a lollipop, please? What we call a lollipop in our dojo, um, a lot of the schools utilize um, just a pool noodle, a floater. So we've got electrical PVC conduit. Okay, it's a tubing, it's hollow. And this allows it to be a little bit more controlled. We use these with the children. And what we've done is we've taken a pool noodle that's hollow, slid it over, and using hot glue, we've glued the top. When the students get really excited, they do break them. So from a, a safety point of view, the moment somebody breaks the PVC tubing, obviously we, we, we've got to discard it. And there's a little bit of a risk. But we've basically got a soft shin eye that we can use. So something like this, or even just a flexible pool noodle. There are a lot of um, clips of uh, instructors and coaches training with fighters using a pool noodle and getting them to react. Thanks, Brian. For extra hard hitting power, we start utilizing the heavy bag so that you can really build that force and we need to practice over and over. We don't want to do 50 punches in a session that are all different. We want to take three or four punches and do uh, a thousand punches with each style of punch so that we can slowly and systematically build up the connective tissue, the muscles, the joints, the bones over time so that we get stronger, so that when we do hit somebody, there is something behind it. And we don't necessarily have to look like these massive, big powerhouses. We can be a normal person minding our business and we're equipped should we need it. If somebody doesn't know who we are and what we do and they happen to attack us, hopefully the physicality of the training, the interactiveness of the training, the free format sparring will then kick in and give us possibly an advantage to allow ourselves to walk away and be safe. And this, I think, is the ultimate goal of good karate or good martial arts in that sense. So, um, Randori should ultimately build to the point that it can be used and can be extracted from for combat, for real life scenario combat. In terms of testing and in terms of grading, when we look at Randori, if the fighters are just continuously throwing the same five techniques and we're attempting a black belt grade, um, and you look at the sheer volume of techniques that are available within the karate system, there is definitely a question that has to be raised about whether or not your randori or your kumite or your fighting is disjointed from your kata. The whole idea behind what we're doing now is to try and bring the two together. That the kata, the textbook, the research that has taken place over hundreds of years or the last hundred years can be drawn upon and can become combat and that we don't lose the ability to utilize the great variety of techniques that occur within the greater spectrum of karate kata and that is where I'm going to leave it for today thank you very much for joining us at the Gorgiri Karate Center Brian come let's take a bow hi Nishima arigato gozaimasu thank you very much for joining us have a fantastic week don't forget to like subscribe Leave a comment.